is supposed to start okay, one fifteen. Okay. So let's see. Maybe hopefully it's not gonna be a lot of people. Can you wait? What
So I'll introduce you to the spectrum teachers. I'm trying to learn them here. Oh, sure. I call you one case. Yeah, some case. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. But <laughs> well, well, I look, you I do know that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that is um, yeah, I know. Yeah, we'll about it. <laughs> so, Okay, well, we've decided we'll make a start and hope that a couple more of our uh, chosen panelists will come. Uh, you've all seen the uh, flyer for this. Uh, so our subject is highly topical and uh, of great importance to, I'm sure, everyone in this room. The Niger coup in regional context, democratization, coup d'etat, and security in West Africa. And here's the organizer of this panel, who is here, Punke, Professor Punke Okome. Um, Pearl Robinson is listed on this panel. We understand she's preferring to contribute from the audience. Um, Emmanuel Balogu missed his flight, so he's not here today from Skidmore College. <laughs> College. And we're expecting, because we haven't heard back to say otherwise, from Mahamadou Bashiru Tangara, University of Social Sciences and Management in Bamako. Yeah, because he's coming from Bamako. He would have. Yeah, so we're hoping he'll, he will show up. And we're also hoping Yolanda Booker from Queen's University will show up. So in that spirit, we I think we all know Pearl Robinson is in the room or comes. Uh, okay. We all know who she is because she's such a prominent Africanist. I'm not going to spend a lot of time doing a lengthy introduction uh, because we want to get to the meat of this session. I've just come from a formal session where I missed the lecture because there were so many formalities before. <laughs> so I'm going to take the moment to, however, to introduce Moji Baolo Okome, aka Funke, a professor with a PhD from Columbia University in 1996 in political science. Her areas of expertise are wide ranging. I know her best of all because of the role she plays in gender, the African journal um, on uh, gender and African cultures and societies. But her areas of expertise include democratization and economic liberalization, human rights, nationalism and ethnicity, economic and political development, state society relations, globalization and gender relations with a focus on Africa and the world economy. And uh, power in African diasporic religious institutions. She's got numerous books and publications. I will mention Shaping Democracy in Nigeria, The Presence and Voices of Women, which is in gender audit. And she's also written a lot on the election issues of political participation and works very much with uh, the women's movement in Nigeria. I know her in that capacity as well. Um, and has done work for the um, on the election for the Women and Advocates Research and Documentation Center. So here we have an academic who is also very engaged on the ground with movements and organizations back home and in the diaspora. So we're hugely honored. She's also, we, we're on the same platform, Feminist Will Manifesto. It's a, a, a listserv that keeps us on the pulse of what's going on with a very active women's movement in Nigeria. So, Pungu was here to actually um, serve as a discussant, but given the wisdom that she had, the fact that she recently wrote something on Niger and Nigeria, that will be the topic. So she's kindly agreed to present that here today. Um, and then we will see if either the other two hopeful presenters, the presenters we're hoping for turn up. And if they do, I'll introduce them and invite them to make presentations too. And then we, I think we have a room full of people who are very capable of having a very productive discussion, which I will moderate. 
So without more ado, I'm going to hand over to Professor Okome to um, take it away for the discussion of Niger-Nigerian foreign relations. Before we do that, would anyone just like a quick update on the situation in Niger? The last two things I would draw attention to here that um, from following the news are the change in the law. Uh, two things, well, through the separate them. One, chasing the French out, that's the big news, um, and forming an alliance with several other newly remilitarized states. The second thing they did was abrogate the law, which they had signed not too many years ago, um, criminalizing trafficking people across Niger. Niger is right on the route from West Africa to Europe. So they complied with the EU directive. So this military government has overthrown that directive and said they're not doing it anymore. Um, so those two big things, the removal of the French military um, and the sort of radicalism as which they're responding to the French alongside others is really what's made in headline news and of concern to the whole. You will know, but well, I'm going to let you talk about Nigeria's responses yeah. um, and then we'll take it from there. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction and generous too. So um, the context in which I wrote my paper is that immediately the coup happened. I have affiliation with the Nigerian National Institute for Policy and Strategic Studies. I did my sabbatical year there last year. So they convened a panel discussion and wanted us to talk about Nigeria, what Nigeria ought to do, because the institute um, is under the Nigerian presidency and they give advice to Nigerian government, much of which is not taken, <laughs> you know. So we had, so I, so the title is the title of the uh, panel discussion. I just focused on Nigeria's response uh, in general. So you have to excuse me, I was prepared to be discussant. Unfortunately, our panelists had all kinds of challenges and couldn't make it. I'm sure there are people who are really deeply steeped in Nigerian politics here. So I'm hoping that after I give my spiel, that we will have a discussion and everybody is welcome to uh, contribute. So, and then the context also is that there were people that gave the context, the deep context. Some of them were military generals, you know, who have experience with um, um, the Sahel. They had done peacekeeping, they, you know, so um, <laughs> I'm afraid I cannot do justice in that respect. Uh, but I wanted to, you know, so what we were said, asked to do is what should Nigeria do? And, you know, um, to give justification that would be advisory. And because um, the people who have um, executive power sometimes are not really big on reading copious amounts of stuff, it has to be very, very brief and to the point. So anyway, um, I think we all know that in July 2023, there was a coup. Uh, but at the time, we heard that the president was detained. Bazoum was detained by the presidential guard. And um, they said they wanted to end um, the deteriorating security situation and bad governance. No, 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 no. Um, please st stay on the first slide. <laughs> And um, the, um, the military junta was led by uh, the head of the presidential guard, Abdurrahman Siani, and he became the head of state. And many people were asking, are we in a coup corridor? You know, because there had been other coups in the Sahel region. Um, with when coups happen also, there are always concerns. We can go to the next slide. They are always concerned about I'm stating, about whether this is contagion, you know, whether it's going to spread 
And Nigeria has had its own experience with pools. I mean, we had so many of them. And I remember reading your Kaba and Kaki, you know, and a lot of the critiques. Yes. Nina, Kaki and the family. Kaki and the family. Nina and Baba. Oh, Nina and Baba. Okay. Is, uh, Kaki, Kaki the and the family. Okay. So there are experiences we've had. And Nigeria is in its fourth republic because we have had so many schools ourselves. So um, Nigeria, Niger is not just our next door neighbor. We have in Nigeria deep historical linkages and complex interdependence with Niger. So what Nigeria, how Nigeria responded was very important. And unfortunately, um, and then there's fear of contagion, you know. Unfortunately, Nigeria was very bellicose. Like we are going to, they immediately cut off electricity. They, um, they, 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 <laughs> they said the, well, uh, that ECOWAS and AU are against coups. And so they were going to apply sanctions. And I think some of those sanctions are still ongoing. Um, now, you know, the whole issue about borders, there's been all these, I mean, everybody knows about Boko Haram and the insurgency in Nigeria. Um, with many Nigerians saying that, oh, it's people from over there, it's not Nigerians. And when they say from over there, most of the time they're point, pointing to Niger. Um, but, you know, there, there are deep familial relationships among Nigerians and Nigerians. And there's ties of trade, diplomacy, and so forth. So it is most unfortunate. And plus the whole issue of borders in Africa, for me, is craziness. Because these borders are hardly legitimate. They weren't even made by us, you know. Okay. So there were some Nigerians that said, look, close the borders. Don't let those people in. There's more Boko Haram and whatever. But actually, paradoxically, Niger was very fierce, fiercer than Nigeria in fighting Boko Haram. Okay. And we can go to the next uh, slide. So, you know, uh, the pe people were saying it's a regional problem. We have a full belt. And when I looked, there's been 486 attempted what? or successful military coups globally since 1950. Okay, I wanted to say that, then, you know, let's look at the global figure. Mm -hmm. But 214, most of them have been in Africa. And 106 of them, of the African ones, are successful. Okay, so 12 coup uh, attempts have been made since 2020, of these ones, so, um, since 2020 in West Africa. It's successful. So are we having an institutionalization of coups? Mm -hmm. My first slide said it's about democracy. I think when we're saying it's about democracy, what kind of democracy? Are you going to, you know, so one of my beefs with democracy as we're looking at it in Africa is that there's this thinking that you can, you can, um, you can sponsor democracy. There's a whole, whole industry of pro promoting democracy. And what democracy is taken to mean is that people have the right to vote. There's a lot of concern. Is the election free and fair? Even myself um, concerned, you know, because a lot of these elections are like North Korean elections, you know. You just know who's going to win before the battle. Um, and there's a lot of intimidation in Nigeria. There's violence and so forth. So we should be concerned. But really, um, to what extent are the governments that are being produced representative of the uh, will of the people? This is very questionable all over the continent. And Nigeria is no exception. So I don't even think that Nigeria has any moral authority to be telling Niger anything about anything, you know. And our president in Nigeria, you know, his own election is questionable. <laughs> Plus, he has a lot of skeletons in his closet <laughs> that I won't go into. So, when it comes to that matter of who he should have just have said, okay, we are studying the situation. But I think he wanted to show that he is a man of action. And so, he immediately made pronouncements, I think, without sufficient consultation. And he did this also 
with the way he handled the currency. He did it this with the way uh, there was something else they did, you know. Subsidy. Subsidy. The fuel subsidy, he just mm. woke up one day and said the fuel subsidy was cancelled through everybody's life in confusion. I was in Nigeria. And so Nigeria has enough of its own problems caused by him. He should have been quiet. He should say we are consulting. And, you know, we're sending diplomatic uh, uh, efforts and whatever. But he did say that if Niger does not mind itself, you know, we are going to invade on behalf of ECOWAS. I think that, you know. So I think there's a fear in Nigeria that hmm, this coup is creeping. You know, it was Mali. You know, there's other countries. And now it's right next door. So Nigeria does not want to. I don't think anybody does want to. But this is the response that the Nigerian government uh, mobilized. The appropriate one is a question. So we can go on. So um, I'm also baffled about ECOWAS. And by the way, AU, because, and I'm going to talk about this later. Yes, it is good for us to have a zero tolerance against schools. But if we're concerned about democracy, a lot of the um, of the moves that they make, it's very wishy-washy, very haphazard, and very, you know, just whatever. So I think ECOWAS also has to show that it is relevant and that it has some kind of control over its region and that when it talks, the countries should listen. Nigeria also, well, Nigeria prides itself uh, as being the giant of Africa. It's a giant without feet <laughs> at the very least. You know, Nigeria wants to play a hegemonic role and it has played a hegemonic role in the past in Africa. I think it wants to maintain that hegemony, but it's a very shaky sort of hegemony because at home, Nigeria's house is not in order, okay? So, um, and then Tinubu coming in feels that whatever happens, I mean, um, he, ne he didn't tell me, I didn't interview him, but the way he was acting was like, uh, what happens in Nigeria is a test for his foreign policy. And he was the president of ECOWAS or something, the chair or something. Or he was the chair uh -huh. before he been appointed a foreign minister. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, so he said, you know, ECOWAS would do this. The question was, who would foot the bill? You know, the a lot of the ECOWAS measures that were taken um, in the past, where the bill was mostly footed by Nigeria. Nigeria is in dire straits with the economy. You wouldn't know it because, you know, they bought all kinds of stuff, including a presidential yacht and um, cars, SUVs for all the legislators and for the office of the first lady and so forth. Uh, but Nigeria has a huge economic problem. So it doesn't need to get involved in foreign adventures of any sort. At least if it would get involved, it is supposed to consult within, you know, and then also consult the other African uh, states. But no, you know, we wanted to be giant and we talked. And then, you know, this whole question of sanctions. I'm a political scientist, international relations. Actually, as much as people love sanctions, they're not effective. And there's a lot of research that goes to this point. A lot of the times, the people who suffer from sanctions are the people who least deserve to suffer. You know, so we are going to do sanctions. But, you know, when you have people who want to be giant, um, who want to, um, to, 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 to take a claim about their being decisive, and I think there was a lot of intervention from the outside that the EU probably also was egging the African leaders on. The, there's too much intervention in African politics mm. from EU, the US, um, you know, the French, um, the British, and so even the Russians are involved in this. And, you know, there's somebody else that was strange, Israel, Israel, you know. So, uh, and you, Niger is a very strategic country because it has 
um, minerals, it has um, commodities that are desired um, by all these countries. And then the US has also drone farm, right? In Niger, doesn't it? So, um, no, in Chad. No, it's Niger. Niger. Oh, it's Niger, okay. Mm -hmm. So all these countries are involved and they are, let's go to the next one. So it's a hyper complex situation. There are too many of these um, foreign bodies interested. I think it's right for ECOWAS to play a key role, but in order to play that role, there has to be more thoughtfulness, you know, to policy making from ECOWAS. AU, the same thing. I find both AU, actually AU more, really just infiltrated by all kinds of forces. The Chinese built the uh, headquarters, bugged it, and AU didn't find out until years after. <laughs> you know, of course, the Chinese denied. Um, when you go to AU meetings, I am personally offended mm -hmm. because Europeans are running all over the place, um, you know, shooting their mouth, uh, lecturing Africans. And I, what are you doing here? Go to Europe and fix your own problem. You know, but nobody in Africa tells them that. It's like, okay, they're giving us aid and whatever. What kind of aid are they likely to give? And France also has played a very damaging role in AU, um, you know, the U.S. is no different, you know, so there's too much meddling and this is going to complicate matters and actually make this problem maybe intractable, you know. The, the people of Niger, I think, are right in having, <laughs> they are the ones that we should be focused on, you know. What do the people of Niger want? And the coup makers have made pronouncements about what is instigating them to have this coup. Of course, the ousted government feels that, oh, we had election, we won, and now they're throwing us out. But how legitimate is that election? Is it that we should just measure the legitimacy of these elections by the fact that people are running freely and people are voting semi-freely? You know, so democracy needs to be interrogated. What does it mean in Africa? And all these people, you know, NDI is promoting democracy, National Democratic Institute, they're US uh, people. Um, IRI, International Republican Institute, are promoting democracy. They give funding. They actually help women a lot. So yeah, some of that is good. <laughs> but listen, I mean, you cannot import or export democracy. And the will of the people must count for something. And you know what I see in our continent is that the will of the people is the last consideration. You know, so what is it that the people of Niger want? I think getting to that will show us, and I, from what one reads in the press, people seem to be supportive of this school. You know, is it an engineered thing that they're uh, producing for the press? I don't necessarily think so. Look, uh, if a coup happens in Nigeria, people would probably celebrate because life is hard. For majority of people, they can't put food on the table. The, the, instead of being concerned, you have these government people just living extra large, traveling all over the place, saying all kinds of inconsequential things. And meanwhile, life is not changing. So I believe that the way that politics is managed in our continent, you know, is not exactly democratic. The will of the people does not count. And until that happens, actually, I believe that we would have um, conditions that are likely to produce coups at very, you know, um, you know, almost spontaneously. So we can move on. So there's no homogeneity of interests, but I do believe that there's support for the coup makers, as according to the news. Um, okay, so in Africa. And in the world at large, we have all these norms, but we selectively apply them, okay? Uh, the UN is guilty, AU is guilty, ECOWAS is guilty, and of course, Nigeria is guilty, because the way we dis 
we, we, we define things depends on the politics of it and what we're going to gain from it. And as long as that's the situation, you know, um, saying that uh, you have zero tolerance when you close your eyes, um, when certain pools happen, or if it's not quite a pool, uh, and, you know, there's illegitimate election, like in Nigeria, you know, you say, okay, it's free and fair. You know, uh, all these election monitors came and they made reports and Americans have congratulated the guy anyway. <laughs> so it's okay. You know, um, then when the hard line is drawn, it actually doesn't cut any ice because we are not applying the norms evenly. Let's go on. Okay. So <clears throat> I wanted, what I did in my talk then was to show how, how we can poorly apply the regulatory frameworks. NIPS is obsessed with regulatory frameworks, okay? <laughs> uh, and also um, show that there's no consensus on how to deal with who's internationally. And I quoted a few sources. What the international system does is to politicize the whole thing. If America feels they have something to gain, it is not a coup. We're still looking at the situation and whatever. If they have nothing you know, to gain or they want to um, incorporate the coup makers into their circle, they will tell you that it is okay. So, so um, what we see is national interest being privileged and geopolitical considerations prevailing in this determination of how do you deal with a coup? And the UN is the guiltiest of all from way back. So let's go on. Um, so the UN has no convention on coup d'etat, but the charter says that um, they can use force when there's a threat to peace and all other measures have failed. But only the Security Council can decide, and you know what happens there. If the B, uh, the G5, the um, US and the winners of the Second World War, if they don't approve, if any of them says they are not going forward, the veto stands, you know. So it's very politicized. Let's go on. Um, so there's chapter seven of the UN Charter. And um, so I don't want to read this whole thing. Um, you know, the when coups happened, the international community protests sometimes. And, um, you know, many people are angling behind the scenes to maintain good relations if there are commodities that they're interested in or their strategic interest. And it isn't, there's no norm that says we don't want coups and people hold on to that and act on it in a way that is ethical and you know legitimate to somebody who wants to be objective. So let's so UN chapter uh, chapter chapter seven says that um, they can determine what to do to restore international peace and security. What has the UN been doing? Please, anybody knows? On this Niger <laughs> Um, So uh, they want to kind of privilege non-military measures, but there are cases in which the UN has decided that there's a need to militarily intervene somewhere. But, you know, um, mostly what happens is the sanctions, okay. interruption of economic relations, um, diplomatic relations would be um, canceled, and the use of force is applied sparingly, I think justifiably, because the UN itself does not have standing army, you know. Nigeria is always volunteering forces because they want to keep those generals busy so that they don't plan coups. So <laughs> I met a lot of people who had been part of UN peacekeeping, um, and they're very proud of their service. So we also have to be clear that Africa was not on the mind of the UN when they founded this organization. We were not there. And our issues are not high priority in the UN, if we don't know. Even if our sister from Nigeria is the uh, deputy secretary general, it means nothing. But structurally, we do not have power, okay? And our issues are not important. And we ourselves act as though our issues are not important. Because the only way it would be important 
is if Africa is able to forego all the things that divide us and act in a united way, that would give us a bit of power in an, in an institution that is structured to give us absolutely nothing because the General Assembly doesn't have any power. Okay, so let's uh, move on. So there are also other articles where you can see what the UN can do. Uh, but frankly, if America and China and uh, the Europeans don't want to do something, there is nothing that would happen. And if any of them, if let's say some want to do it and any of them object in the Security Council, not the people who rotate in and out, you know, the permanent ones, nothing would happen. Okay, so let's move on. Um, so the UN also, um, you, you can, as a neighboring country, Nigeria, for example, could say, okay, we object to this, we're going to support maybe a bazoom. <laughs> Thankfully, we didn't do that, you know. Um, so there are ways in which you can see that there are clear violations of some of the norms that the UN has, and the UN has done nothing except when the um, is it the 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 Security Council members want something to be done. Let's move on. Okay, the African Union has declared its clear opposition to coups d'etat, I think it is justifiable because, you know, coups are destructive. Many of the coup makers, mm -hmm. at least from Nigeria's experience, they have no clue on how to uh, govern and they wreck <laughs> the economy, they wreck the political relations, their social relations, you know, their management of social relations are also very poor, you know, so they have, should be against it. But if we are against coups d'etat, we have to be consistent. And what my complaint is, is against the lack of consistency. Let's, so yes, there's been so many coups. And this was the way of changing government because people wanted to sit tight. And I mean, you know, look at Cameroon, how long the president has been there. Look at uh, Uganda, you know, some of these people don't want to leave. And it seems as if the coups is the only way to get them to leave. So again, is it democracy when the same guy keeps winning, when they change the constitution to reflect their interests and they are able to make their will prevail against whatever it is that the people want? Um, okay, let's go. So, OAU said we don't want coups. We want free and fair elections, noble ideals. Let's go. AU reiterates this and said, if you do this coup, we're going to suspend you. But they're not very good at doing that, especially when people force their way into power, but there's election. You know, so they, they close their eyes, they say, okay. Uh, they even made them the president of organizations. Um, so the AU is trying to build institutions that would make some of these ideas work. But this, um, and you know, I love my people because we, we, we do all these words and we have pronouncements and proclamations and declarations. So we have this one. And how do you apply the sanctions? What exactly does it constitute? Um, in what cases would they be applied? Again, just like the UN, AU plays politics with this. Let's go on. There's also um, an enumeration of the kinds of sanctions that AU would apply. We can move on because I think I'm talking too much, actually. Um, so the AU will condemn coups ad infinitum. And um, some states have been suspended. You can see the dates. Um, but <laughs> the way in which things evolve show that uh, AU could care less. 
So we have the legal frameworks. I think what is needed now is consistency. And as for Nigeria, after Nigeria, um, you can, yeah. after Nigeria, Epo, I, I talk about ECOWAS also. It's the same deal that we have a um, regulatory framework that is not evenly applied and it shows no commitment. So Nigeria wants to play uh, the regional hegemon. What is it that Nigeria wants to get out of this? Immediately, the uh, sanction of cutting off the uh, electricity was applied. There were immediate effects, humanitarian effects on people. And then people trying to flee from Niger were actually coming through the border to Nigeria. In the border area, there was a um, an evolving humanitarian crisis. The prices of commodities in Niger escalated. You know, um, there's a lot of human suffering. And the um, what is it that Nigeria stands to gain? Nigeria and Niger also have agreements on um, flood management. You know, there are dams in Niger that if Niger decides to release their dam, a whole lot of Nigeria would be under the deluge because Nigeria also did not build its side of the dams that were supposed to be built that would correct this problem. So I don't know uh, that antagonizing Niger is a very good idea for Nigeria. Secondly, like I said, there are long-term familial relationships and a lot of uh, in interdependence between Niger and Nigeria. Well, I think Niger retaliated a bit. When the president of Nigeria was returning from some, some foreign trip, they wanted to pass through Nigerian air, airspace and they were told they couldn't, you know. So I don't know how they managed where they went, you know. Um, so Niger Nigeria cannot afford to antagonize Niger. I think if Nigeria wants to play a hegemonic role, in West Africa and Africa, it needs to, uh, in a matured manner and thoughtful manner, engage the other um, states in a respectful way. Also, I mean, um, yes, Europe has its agenda. France has its agenda. The US has their agenda. Those should not be Nigeria's agenda. What is Nigeria's agenda? Why? Are these things Nigeria's agenda? I think building a relationship where we are able to develop our you know, region and we are able to um, nurture the relationships among us is more important than making empty threats that destroy uh, people's lives, create complications. And actually also, you know, for Nigerians, a lot of food that was being um, exported from Niger to Nigeria, God, they were not available. You know, food is very expensive in Nigeria now. And Niger, uh, Nigerians who are trying to escape through the Sahara to go and Japa in Europe, they pass through <laughs> Niger, you know. And actually, I don't think the Nigerian government wants people to stay. So if they want to be letting off steam that way, it's also important to be on friendly terms with Niger. So frankly, I think that um, Nigeria's response was excessive. It was immature and ill-considered. And um, in terms of coups, there was an attempt, although the Sierra Leonean said it wasn't a coup, you know, just a few days ago. It's about democracy. If we want to have democracy, how do we manage it? You know, um, how is the will of the people reflected? And in terms of um, these Sahelian nations that have had coups, a lot of the complaint is about France, and it's um, its negative role in um, exploiting the um, the countries 
and resistance to that. So, you know, some of these schools are being presented as anti-colonial. And I think one can say yes, in some instances they are. But how do we change governments without resorting to schools? It's up to Africans. And the leaders that we have right now are not really uh, acting consciously in terms of their attention to their regulatory framework that they said they brought up themselves in these institutions, uh, regional institutions. And then in terms of foreign policy making, there's a need to do much better. Uh, and Nigeria wants to play big, big brother. It needs to really develop the capacity to make better decisions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, uh, Professor Okome, for really addressing the entire title of this session, the Niger coup in regional context, democratization, coups, and security in West Africa. Um, thank you very much. Um, for those of you who joined us a few minutes late, you, um, I'll share with you that we're missing I hope it's not a reflection of the insecurities of the region, um, but I'm sorry to say we're, we're, we're missing some of our panelists. So that is why I gave ample time to uh, Professor Okome to give us an address because I can see who's in this room. Uh, clearly we have a very, very good uh, opportunity for a discussion here. So I'll begin by thanking her for that and saying, I'm very happy to see Pearl Robinson, who was on the list, but has chosen to spoken from the floor, maybe because you had another appointment because you came in a little late, but I'm gonna also in involve you in this. Um, Emmanuel, Mr. Splice, Mamadou and Yolanda. Uh, Mamadou is coming from Bamako. We don't know what happened to him and we don't know what happened to Yolanda. So we're going to make do, and uh, thank you for being so, for taking the opportunity, I should say, to um, adapt and, and therefore share your incredible knowledge of the region and security issues in Nigeria for all the interests you have. Clearly, this one is very, very close to your heart as it is to be mine. Um, and I want to thank you for really starting with the July coup, um, shaming the Nigerian Bellicose was the word to use, the Nigerian response from a president who had only just got into power, highly questionably, um, immediately declaring sanctions. Um, and I, I think the giant with the big foot, he put his foot right in. Um, thank you for summarizing that. Thank you for giving us the global context. I have no idea there were 486 coups in the world. Since the, the two hundred since, since nineteen fifty, yeah. two hundred and fourteen in Africa. That's less than half. It's about forty eight percent. Yeah, I was going <laughs> mad. <laughs> <laughs> One hundred and six have been successful, and I don't think that figure. I mean, Zimbabwe said it. We said it was a coup. They said it was not a coup. Yeah, yeah. yeah. A coup, not a coup. So now the data may be incomplete. Yeah. because coups are no longer coups in the world that we <laughs> inhabit. I thought we um, had um, have coup experts who. Would... Well, we definitely <laughs> need to. We, we, no, no, we, we just need to understand that elections, even elections, can be coups. Yeah, yeah. Palace coups. we've always known about. Yeah, them. palace coups. Um. But uh, I, I also appreciate the way you dealt with the different layers of the foreign policy context, both the global international the role of the, the great powers that we have relied on uh, for so long, mm. and, and the mess and the danger that we face as a result of all those external interests, and then the policy failure of the UN. I want to say that when you directly confront them with this, they say it's Secretary General and Deputy Secretary General. I ask you tell them, and they say, we're secretaries, we don't have power, we're not generals. We can only go as far as the member states. The UN has inbuilt limitations. Happy to see that the AU and efforts have done a little more in terms of thinking about maybe one day stopping things, but certainly in terms of policy regulation. There's a commitment, a moral commitment. Um, to end coups, while democracy remains challenging and problematic. So um, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm summarizing because some people came in late. I don't <laughs> normally summarize. Um, so now the floor is open. Hello. Um, and I'd like to, may I call on you, sure. uh, lean on you <laughs> as like a sort of second panelist <laughs> to take a couple of minutes and then we'll open up to the floor. And if you'd like to come up here, Please do. Yeah. Room is packed. Room is traumatized. <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you, my dear sister, for giving such a great overview. Uh, when I got an invitation, asked if I would like to uh, be involved with this, I said yes, because I understood that the outcome would be some sort of a policy document about possible ways forward. And I certainly wanted to be involved with that. Uh, I will say that I did, was not prepared to do a presentation here, but I do have a few things I would like to say about this. This is why I especially appreciate your overview. And I will just be talking about somebody who studied politics, started studying politics in Niger about 40 years ago and they had a one, power, one party state. I've studied military regimes and transitions and attempts to uh, sort of fix the, uh, the, the security architecture, not only of the individual countries in the Sahel, but Africa as a, as a continent with a regional security architecture. I also have been present when coups took place. So as you were talking about what is a coup and do people think coups are good? Before I was present when a coup was taking place, I will tell you, what was I there studying? I had gone there to study. Ah, yes, yeah, so the, it was the Kunche regime, and I was studying uh, political participation under a military regime. But there was a period when there were coups, and the coup leaders didn't leave. They didn't have these uh, agreements to get rid of them, and they didn't want to leave. But some of the smarter ones said, well, what's the participation? What's the deal? They're saying we don't have regular people can't participate in politics. So why don't we create mechanisms for people to participate in politics, and we will over we will oversee those. Sankara did this. The Kunche regime did this. Others did this, and so that's what I was in Niger studying. And they and in Niger it followed like a five tier uh, system going from. Uh, they called it the Societe de Développement. So those politicians, they were doing politics and messing up stuff. The, the coup was taken. It was going to be a corrective military regime, and we're going to fix things. But we know that just military people by themselves can't fix things. So what we're going to do is we're going to allow uh, regular people to be involved in some kind of political participation on the ground. And that's what I was interested in studying. And while that was happening, or no, this is a different, well, so I have studied that. And that was interesting. I had come back when they were now going to have a trip after uh, the world change post Berlin called democratization spreading over Africa. Uh, so <laughs> what was happening there, I had actually gone there to study uh, the role of Muslim women in the new. Uh, participatory institutions or whatever it is they were trying to do and but the military was still in power but they were setting up to have a national conference which i did not go to study and i was having uh, i i listened to the radio every morning and i heard the music on the radio that announces a coup military music <laughs> and i thought i wonder if this is a coup <laughs> And I was staying in a house that an American USAID representative lived and they let me spend uh, two months in the house. So I got up and the guard, the Tuareg guard who was in the yard, I said, is there a coup going on? I heard this music on the radio. And he said, no, 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 go back inside. So I went inside, then I heard shooting. <laughs> And this house was not too far from the presidential palace. It was in the, the area they fixed up for the people who come to help live. And I said, I'll bet there's a coup. And then I went out again. I said, well, they're shooting to get back in the house. <laughs> I, I was waiting for the announcement of who had won. There was no announcement. And so Pearl thinks, you know, turning to the political scientist, participant observation. <laughs> I get dressed oh my God. <laughs> and then there's a lot of shooting and then it gets quiet. And I said, apparently whatever's happening, there's a lull. I wanna go outside and see. I got on my bicycle and I started riding into town to go to the research institute. And I saw, of course I'm crazy. I saw these, ba these benches blocking the road and everything and I didn't see anything. So I went into town. 
And I went to the research institute and I said, what's happening? Is there a coup? And they said, don't say anything. You shouldn't be out on the road. And in fact, you should get home. You should go home because Kunchi is out of the country and it looks like some military people are there and they're trying to secure the palace and, and they apparently gotten a radio station to put on military music. I said, well, I can't go home now because they're fighting there. So I went to a restaurant and I said, I'll wait it out at the restaurant. To get to the restaurant, should I stop? No, no I'm gonna get to my, my new understanding of what it means to have a coup. On the way to the restaurant, I pass, rode past the market where they sell vegetables and everything. It was empty. Getting to the restaurant, I saw big trucks and they were full of people. They had emptied out the, the, the market and there were military things coming. So this restaurant was an outdoor restaurant, big walls and everything. And I said, is a coup going on? And they said, yes, <laughs> you shouldn't be here. Uh, so I sat down uh, and in the kitchen, there was just like this little kitchen. People were listening to the radio and there were some Frenchmen. They said, it's really getting bad here. We were just in Chad and they had a coup there. And now we come to Niger and they're having a coup. Mm -hmm. And then somebody came and was banging on the, the gates to be let in and they were shooting. And he says, they're out here shooting. And then I thought, this is really bad. And so the people, the cooks in, in the restaurant, they were inside the kitchen and we all got inside and we have to wait. Initially, we were under the tables. And then I thought, I don't care who wins as long as it's the strongest. That's when I understood the Leviathan. <laughs> I said, right now, because the Kunche was flying back, according to the, the, the radio, and then these people were ready to confront him. And we were going to determine who the next leaders would be. And I'm out there with gunshot going on and I said yes I don't care who wins somebody needs to be able to come in and restore stability I need to be able to get back to my house and then figure out how I'm going to get through the next days and eventually when Kunche came back his side won uh, and he went back to the palace and we had they changed the music and we were told that there was an abortive coup so when I kind of hear the thing, when there is a coup, what is it that people want? Immediately, you want stable governance. And then you want, you know, if you care about politics, one of the things you will do is to try to figure out how can I live my life without worrying about this political thing? I guess that's what I was doing when I got on my bicycle and started riding down to find out what was going on. Um, and there's a sense of security versus insecurity where the people who can at least control the people who have the guns are the ones that you want on your side. Now, as time goes by, you realize that these people don't, well, they do know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. But what they're not doing is making life better for people as a whole. And that's the point at which you start trying to figure out how can I live my life? And one of the options that people put on the table was a return to electoral regimes that have some kind of periodic uh, dependability and expectations that even if you can't really determine who's gonna run the government or sanction people who are doing bad things, you can get on with the daily terms of life. And then I guess decide for people who may have the options to leave to do that, and then they're the ones who actually care and want to live where they want to live in this place. And they're trying to figure out, can we create safe spaces? Can we uh, create or maintain some spaces of empowerment? And then you have the people who come to help. These are the NDIs. These are the, the people who are the, uh, the who, who, who specialize in democracy building. Uh, help you put things together so that you can have an election. Then we got to the point where it, it seemed that you need to have, in Africa, you need to have outsiders to come and validate elections. Now, some people say it's as though you think Africans can't do it themselves. 
in my view, having sort of lived through the period when you had elections were either just suspended or called off, regimes just renewed themselves without elections, um, or um, they annulled elections. I, in the initial period, I saw election monitors that all these people internationally come to observe an election, it's harder for a regime to say, we're canceling it. And so, and I have been uh, an election monitor twice. I did the transition in Nigeria from military to civilian. And that was my first eye opening about what that meant. It did not mean, it did not mean saying this was election that was free and fair. It meant enabling that election process to go through uh, and to have somebody sworn in as the new civilian president. Uh, because <laughs> I won't go into those details, but at any rate, we're in, in our group, there were people who observed elections where there were no ballots brought out for people to vote on. There were people who observed all kinds of things. But I went up to, to Northern Nigeria. I said, I want to go be an observer where I can understand the local language. And so I went where they speak Hausa and spent time there and then drove back from Sokoto to Abuja to the hotel where we were supposed to report. And when I arrived, they said, go in that room. Jimmy Carter and... Um, the Republican guy, the general, Colin Powell, they're giving their report now. And I walked in and Jimmy Carter and Colin Powell were saying the elections were over and they were free and fair. And I said, but we haven't, we haven't given our day. And they said, sit down, sit down. Uh, and, and so they, they said they were, they made this report. And then we were told by the Carter Center people, well, Carter is now going to elections in Indonesia. So he's about to leave, but stand up and get your picture taken with him. One, one of the people in our party had been attacked by robbers. They stole their all their jewelry, their passports, their money. The man with his wedding ring, they wanted his ring. He couldn't get it off. They're about to chop his fingers off. But people had stories they wanted to tell. And so our group said, we are going to go to the press and tell our story. So they kind of calmed us down and they said, all right, well, Jimmy Carter has to leave, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna be ordered food and your group, you can stay here and each group can say what you uh, saw and then we'll figure out where we're gonna go. And then one of the, there was a Moroccan prince who was there and he said to us when we were eating, he said, so what is it you think you're gonna do? If you go to the press and you say that you saw election irregularities, and they annul the elections, you will be responsible for the continuation of military rule in Nigeria. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's when the light went on for me. Okay, I'm not gonna, you know, this is a bad deal. We got through and then they told, while we were there uh, eating and they, we were gonna make, we were making our reports while we were eating, the radio was on and they were giving the results and they gave the results in this one place where the people had been robbed. They said, they didn't even vote. And so, it's, anyway, that was my first experience. And what happened the next day, we got two people from our group who could be counted on to not tell the truth at the press conference. And they got through that. But it was the local election monitors who did their truth telling. And even when I was going back to the U.S. on the plane on uh, uh, British Airways, there was a story about things that we saw. And then after the inauguration, uh, they, in fact, the Carter Center changed its report from saying, well, there were some ir irregularities, but not enough to uh, change the outcome to there were many irregularities, so much so that we cannot say for sure that they didn't impact the outcome. Um, so we have a whole series of uh, procedures now for having elections, making sure they happen, and they get validated in this international system that has been created. Uh, and that's a lesson, that's a life, life, learn, life 
long lesson with me when I see elections. The only other time I did election monitoring was when I was in Niger and they were having local level elections the very first time. And I was working on this Mama Chota movie and I wanted to get some pictures of women uh, voting. So I actually went to the UNDP and I became a UNDP election monitor. And I thought, well, this is low stakes. It's just, you know, local level stuff. And I met the person who was there for the president's party. I was just at the local level. This is now a civilian regime. And he said, I'm here to make sure that the president's party wins these uh, local elections. And I said, well, what does that mean? He said, I'm here to make sure that the president's party wins the local elections. They happened to put me in the house of the man who was the head of the largest opposition party. So I was, we had breakfast together and he explained to me how they were gonna win the elections. They had their people out at night and they were passing out the thousand francs CFAs, but they tore each one in half. And then to show that you had done what you were supposed to do, you got the other half. And so he explained that to me. Um, but so I went out, I observed all this, and there were like uh, five or six different parties at least. And I had gone through the, the, the training for people who were the local election monitors. And they just were saying one of the simple things with these ballot boxes, how you were supposed to uh, close them. So I'm sitting there really, really with my camera trying to get finished. Okay, I will end it. Okay, so let me just say one last thing. Okay, and I saw I saw that the ballot boxes were open. I noticed that people were online and there was all this fidgeting, and what and so I was trying to figure out what was going on. And the ballot boxes aren't locked, and so I I violated the rules. I got up and I attached and closed the ballot box, and I sat back down. And people came over and they said thank you. And I thought, well, this is really terrible. They all saw this was going on and nobody dared. And I thought they were going to take me away because I had violated it, but they didn't. That night, when everything was when everything was supposed to be over at about midnight, a man came from the um, prefecture and he said, we're going to have a meeting at two o'clock in the morning and we're going to recount the ballots. <laughs> And I was tired. I was going to go to sleep. And I said, well, wait a minute. You need to go. And he had all these ballots on a table. And he said that we're going to recount the ballots. And those things that all that process had gone through, we're going to correct it. So that's what the president's guy had told me he was going to do. And I was, I thought, okay, now I'm complicit to election uh, malfunction. But then I saw people in the room, Nigerians, they got up with their cell phones. And then the man who was sitting in the front with the ballots, the phone rang and he said, we have to stop the, pro the process. What they had is they had people in the Capitol and people there. They had their own people and they reported it and they stopped election fraud. And at that point I said, I will never ever be an election monitor again. But what I do know that it is possible for people to monitor their own elections. And that's what this election thing should be about. Uh, so I will stop. I understand why some people applaud a coup when it happens. I know that there's election fraud. And I actually know that if people have the will and the means and the way, they can change it. So internationally, the people who do this work, scholars, the challenge is, to find out ways to enable people and help people to do what they know how to do and they will do when they have a chance. Well, I think that was a perfect compliment to Professor Okombe's presentation because she gave us really a, a testimony um, that lends a whole dimension of reality to, to the kind of policy and political issues that were at the table in the overview that we began with. So thank you very much for that. And I mean, the testimonies just reach us in a different way. So at this point, we're open for discussion. Thank you. You will be very patient. No. Um, I've let both speakers go because we did not have two speakers.
we can actually uh, problematize democracy <laughs> in Africa. And should we replace democracy with uh, something else? And must we um, stick to that idea of Western democracy in Africa? And is Western democracy the best form of government for Africa? That's just uh, one question that, that I want to ask. And then you, you made mention about um, democratic elections, a democratic process. Uh, we understand how this democracy evolved from after uh, the 1960s, after the independence uh, movement. But again, um, the military, we know we say the military is truncating democracy. Mm -hmm. But the question is, do we really have a democracy at all in the first place? Okay. That's the question we need to ask. And uh, have we ever had democracy in Africa? So I just want us to think about this and see how we can so problematize that word, democracy. Thank you. Thank you very much for that question. What we'll do is take a couple, uh, but those are quite profound questions. Thank you. Professor um, Ade. Okay, thank you very much. Really a uh, great presentation uh, from my sister there. I think the situation with Nigeria is even more serious because the country that did really noble peacekeeping in the 1990s and stabilized both Liberia and Sierra Leone today is facing a $100 billion debt. Its army isn't even capable of launching an intervention even if it wanted to. You know, it's armored personnel carriers have broken down in UN missions in Dafur and elsewhere, and it has struggled to contain the insurgency in the Northeast of the country. So I think the situation with the Gulliver is one where it has clay feet and cannot even intervene, even if it wanted to. I thought you were a bit unfair on the African Union because the one thing the African Union has done well is its Peace and Security Council. Um, and they have been consistent, but they've been consistent in terms of suspending military governments, even suspending the Egyptian government uh, after the coup in 2013, which Obama supported. Um, and considering that Egypt has contributed about 15% of its budget, that was courageous. And then the chair, you made a comment that the election of Tinumbu was highly questionable. Question. I don't like Tinumbu myself or support him, but I think it's irresponsible to make a statement like this without evidence. And I listened very carefully to the Supreme Court judgment. All elections in Nigeria have been logistically problematic. Uh, the opposition did not provide evidence to actually make any kind of coherent case. So I think like Chimamanda has been doing in the New York Times and others, this is basically quite irresponsible, isn't it, to be making these claims without evidence? Ade, I think uh, we will, I will respond in a moment. Um, is that the end of your question? Yeah, my comments and questions. Thank you. Comments and questions. Okay. I don't generally think I'd be responsible. We have other questions. Oh, I've got that. I actually wanted to say yeah. comments and oh, questions. Could you introduce yourself? And oh, hello, everyone. My name is Hadiza Kiri Abdurrahman. Um, so, I'm uh, from Niger. Niger. No, Niger. No, Niger. Niger. No, Niger. 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 Okay. Um, I wanted to say if democracy needed decolonizing, so just off the back of that, if what is and I really 
I'm going to throw it out there while losing my democracy, moderators, especially me, <laughs> with the dividends and everything else happening in the world with democratic governance. And I don't know if that's something we should aspire to. So we're talking democracy here, but is it overrated? Thank you. Thank you for that question. Let's take one more comment or question for me. I'm going to ask one. Yes. What is the purpose of democracy? <laughs> and your name? My, oh, my name is Linda Green. I'm from Michigan State University. Thank you. Mm -hmm. What is the purpose of democracy? <laughs> She's a troublesome woman. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm going to give um, Professor Okome a chance to respond. Well, would you care to respond to any of these issues raised? No, I you want to <laughs> sit here. Okay, you know, okay, so, then I, you know, so I think people it, heard me when I said it's about democracy, but that you can't um, export democracy. You know, and I, 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 I don't agree with the notion that democracy is a Western thing, you know, um, because from what I know, and this is not kind of conjecture, we had democracy and democratic institutions in many African communities before we had Western intervention. You know, um, liberal democracy, the kind of democracy that people are saying they are uh, promoting, um, it might be, I mean, it is not, um, I think there's too much concern for um, for the freedom to run for elections and then the freedom to, the presumed freedom to vote. Now, about the Tinubu thing, there's a difference between not winning a case in the Supreme Court and uh, saying that uh, people are concocting. Uh, 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 excuse me, I just want to, can I finish? Sorry. You know, there was enough evidence was enough of irregularities. And by the way, I was in Nigeria during those elections. You know, uh, of course, I wasn't all over Nigeria. But there was a lot of discontent by people. And, the, you know, I listened to the local election monitors. There was a lot of irregularity. A lot of the people, uh, staff from NIPS, from the National Institute for Policy and Strategic Studies, went and did election monitoring. When they came back, said, how did it happen? They said, hey, well, how I did, you know, because there was too much rigging, violence, and there was a lot of violence, and there was intimidation. And so, you know, yes, I think in, in, in terms of let's have stability, the Supreme Court can do whatever it wants. The people who win, who are writing the history, will say that it is legitimate. It wasn't legitimate. Well, CPD and report. We not interject and let me finish that. Sorry, Nigerians, brother and sister. We'll do it. We'll man, please. Okay, so the order has been established. Thank you. So, so you know, I think that there were serious irregularities, and still, I am. I have not been contented with any Nigerian election since we had the fourth republic. It is, I think we're making baby steps and maybe we'll get there, but pushing your way through. I mean, the, the whole way in which the president said, hey, local, it is my turn. And he said that he had been helping people. He was the one that helped this one and that one, and now it is his turn. And he was intent on being the president regardless. It's very offensive to the idea that we're having this election. You are not supposed to know the results before the elections are held. And there were documentations of serious irregularities. However, the Supreme Court has ruled that people want to move on with their life. I agree with you, Pearl, that at some point, people just want to have peace. And actually, that, those elections, there was very little participation. Because from the get go, many people didn't have the confidence that it was going to be done well. Okay. Um, so, yes, Nigeria's military is very weak. Um, a lot of the, of the um, what is it called, uh, material they have is substandard. There's been a lot of fraud in that. 
um, it's a shame that things have just, just you know, deteriorated to this point. Uh, so actually, Nigeria needs to fix a lot of these things. And it is not for lack of Nigerians who have knowledge about these things. Say, you know, giving advice and giving roadmaps to how it can, it can be done. Is there political will to do this? I don't think so. Um, the AU um, has done well. <laughs> well, you know, so I won't go into it. Democracy is overrated. Yes. And security. Come on. I think it's just fair to not misrepresent questions. I said in peace and security. I'm not even responding to that. I think the AU skip, has done well. I want to skip over that. And I don't appreciate you interjecting every so often. Um, Hadiza is democracy overrated indeed. You know, okay, so even here, the people who love America are saying there's backsliding of democracy. You look in Europe, there's all kinds of right-wing regimes coming in. There's a lot of disruptive, um, not in a good way, um, you know, um, individuals with um, with anti-democratic tendencies um, in the US. And so the bastions of democracy themselves, democracy is being, it's, it's, it's wobbling, you know. I think in spite of that, that if we in Africa want to have democracy, let's organize it. Because it's a way of having regular turnover where people, if it worked well, where if people did not do well, you can throw them out. But the, the way in which money plays a role in these processes is just, um, you know, it's breathtaking. So um, if somebody doesn't have serious money, and I mean, you know, like bullion bands in your yard, you cannot win election, the presidential election in Nigeria. You know, so that in itself, is making the democracy look um, problematic. Plus, you know, I kept talking about the will of the people. Where are the, you know, where's the majority in this? Where is, Nigeria has 133 million multidimensionally poor people. Where is their interest primary in the considerations of all these gladiators that come out and are running for, for stuff? You know, and I think if we don't take that seriously, we are not doing democracy. You know, uh, where are women? Nigeria has managed to muzzle and push women out of the political process. We have like 3% women in our national legislature. It is illegitimate and it is immoral and it is unethical and undemocratic for that to be the situation. You can't find poor people in Nigerian politics. You know, so how is it democratic? Disabled people totally sidelined. The youth. Asylum. So, you know, it is not democracy when you shut out the majority and then all these rich people are just using the political um, arena as their plate. Um, what's the purpose of democracy? Good question. <laughs> no answer to that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll keep that one in play. Uh, Pearl, raise your hand to yeah, some response. Yeah, and then we'll take another round. I just wanted to say that. What I look at or look for is what are the political accountability mechanisms? And you could say, are elections that doing that? If not, where else do you look for that? And so I would sort of hope that as we're saying and we identify the flaws of the of elections, that we also ask and try to find answers to what are the political accountability mechanisms that can work given the context. Okay, now I think that is a very responsible question. Um, I say on the on the question of responsibility and irresponsibility, I have the view, uh, Ali, that complicity is irresponsible. So that's where I start. So yes, if I say the, the election was questionable, is because I am not happy to be complicit in a farce. Okay. Now, other okay, questions. That's, your answer. Oh, that's my answer to you. And then there's a whole bevy of hands here. So I'm going to start. Can you say your name? Yeah, I, I'm Amson. Uh, Amson. Yeah. And then, sorry, with the green shirt at the back. 
My name is uh, Kanaj. Your second. Oh. Other hands? Third? The fourth. Thank you. We'll take those four and then I'll come back to you. Um, we still have uh, 20 minutes. Ah, yeah, we're not, we're not. We can be calm in our news. Uh, can you speak up in English? Sure. The uh, alliance that was recently formed ah, between the Niger, uh, Mali, and Burkina Faso, is there any indication that those three states would be interested in sort of power sharing and, and sort of extending some of their uh, domestic? Democratic sort of operations between the three. Thank you for that question. So they want to extend, collaborate and extend it with. Yes, uh, among the three of them in terms of uh, regional security in the cell more broadly, but also in terms of uh, political institutions among the three of them. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Professor, uh, for your presentation. So uh, my question is about um but the backsliding democratic backsliding in Africa and it's about when we make uh comments about how democracy is the shading of backsliding in Africa, we always tie it to the uh, probably failure of the system, the institutions, and probably the corrupt practices of the leaders. But I want to see I want to know if there's a way to understand uh Western or Foreign, uh, foreign, uh, yeah, uh, role, the role of foreign uh, institutions in democratic backsliding in Africa. How can we, you know, make sense of their role in democratic backsliding yeah. in Africa? Is there any role they have played in guaranteeing democracy? Yeah, we have one more here. Yes, in terms of democracy, I wanted to put two items on the table. The first is um, the economist Amartya Sen has written on freedom and democracy, and he alleges um, he won the Nobel Prize in mm -hmm. economics yeah. in around 2000, mm -hmm. and he alleges that um, or claims in his book on de development and freedom that accountability um, in political arrangements, not necessarily democracy, but when people can hold their leaders accountable, <laughs> famine does not occur. And he claims that famine has not occurred in, in um, political situations where there is accountability. So with it, he's from Bangladesh, so it's not a Western frame. Mm -hmm. And this question of accountability, avoiding famine and shared prosperity is something that he writes about. So I just wanted to put that on the table as one item. The other thing about American backsliding and American democracy and capitalism in the West, um, Thomas Jefferson, when he wrote the Declaration of Independence, owned 225 slaves and cultivated tobacco. <laughs> and in the notes on Virginia, he describes the institution of slavery while he's writing the Declaration of Independence as holding a fox by the ear, and he didn't want to let it go. And as a result of not resolving that problem, American democracy today is in trouble, and we can see how race is threaded through all of the problems that we're facing from, you know, the birther movement that um, got from, you know, into politics and how that was his launch. And it was show me your birth certificate, black man. So, so these are issues that we contend with, right? I mean, I think Western democracy is very problematic and that there are other references such as from Bangladesh and accountability and so on to consider um, when we think about the value of democracy. Thank you. Thank you. So, and lots more coming. So. Yeah, so democracy is not a like uh, a destiny. It's it's not a fixed thing. And yes, now that um, you mention it, it's not just now that the backsliding began. The whole foundation in the U.S. and the fact that um, an undemocratic situation was presented as democratic is questioning. Well, you know, um, I think that's the thing about hegemony and the hubris that comes from it. Mm. The hegemonic um, forces or uh, institute or um, hegemonic actors 
um, tend to write history uh, in their own interest. And then they have the power to carry it into the world and impose it, you know. So I, I don't even think that the, the British too, uh, you know, and you know, sometimes also you have this thing of after the evolution from this, from slavery, you had situations where you could still question the extent to which the US was democratic. But even the people who accepted that, like uh, Robert Dahl, talks about the fact that what America has is not democracy, but um, what is that? Polyarchy. Polyarchy. You know, so we can still, we can criticize we can criticize uh, Western democracy and its limits. And we can also criticize some people who accept that, oh, America is democratic, but they say, okay, it's democratic at home, but abroad, it is highly autocratic and dictatorial and whatever. So um, so I think we are, if we want to buy into this idea that we have an international community, it can't just be the powerful actors that are talking about what we need to do. And what I said, I think that I didn't explain, is that we Africans had democracy before the white people came. That if we want, at least you know it was imperfect, but we had notions of democracy, we can create this. Well, you have to let people, you know, um, you talked about um, uh, accountability, right? It's not just accountability, it's what does participation mean? Mm -hmm. It just you go and vote for you don't even know what the hell these people are about. Tinopu refused to have a debate with anybody. He said he didn't want them to steal his ideas. <laughs> and most of the time he's incoherent. You know, so I think that you know, um, whatever it is that the Americans are doing and the British are doing and the Europeans are doing, what kind of value do we have in Africa on our own rights and what we want out of life? And what, where do we want to go? What do we want to leave for the future generations? There are people who are concerned about this, but their voices are not being given any kind of, they, you know, they know before the fact that whatever they do, it's not going to change anything. I have so many people say, I'm not even going to vote. You know, young people, oh, and then the ones who went, some of them were met with violence. You know, and I want to say that in elections in Nigeria, women are actually raped sometimes. Some of them are election workers. So to come and start saying that the, the Supreme Court said something, they will say that because they are working for you know, Okay. Um, so I think, yeah, we, we need to look inwards and build our own models. But if that is going to happen, people have to be allowed to truly participate. Mm -hmm. And there's no space for that. And money is too strong in this. Yes, there are external actors. And some of them sponsor coups too. There was a time, um, what's that in Tajastan, sponsored a coup in one of the African countries, you know. So, and, um, you know, sometimes the too much help is a bad thing. <laughs> Um, uh, so I, I admire people who want to promote democracy, but, um, it's a job. And as long as we don't have good democracy, these people are going to have a job, you know? So that's my cynical take, that we need to work on these things ourselves. And it's not easy. It wasn't easy. It's not been easy anywhere. It can't be easy in Africa. But the way in which, uh, uh, you know, the way in which these um, election monitors come in and then, oh, the EU has said something and the Americans have said something, and what the local people are saying, who are also observing, is shoved under the carpet and not really attended to it is offensive. Mm -hmm. uh, we are not, you know, so we are operating the world as if we are still, we are still colonies. Yeah. Thank you. Okay.
So we have we have time. We have ten minutes. So we have time for another round. So we're going to have to be short questions. And thank you for your energy. If you're having to do it. Uh, exercise. You got money to jump on. Um, Catherine, Larry. Catherine, I missed from the last round, and then we will take sister at the back there. My brothers, you two have been waiting since the last round. I'm here. And you could be the last round. So you've actually already touched on what I was going to ask and comment on, which is the de democracy as we think of it today or as we practice it today, it is obviously very flawed, mm -hmm. and it was flawed from centuries ago. It is very, it's inextricably linked with money and capitalism. And so can we as scholars, as activists, we imagine how we want to uh, move on in terms of developing new political structures. Um, and if so, what would that look like? Um, I'm imagining we don't, perhaps we don't even need a president. <laughs> exactly, they're too expensive. <laughs> so, um, do you have any yeah, yeah. suggestions? Thank you. Uh, okay, thank you. Next, yes. So, how does the issue to have social systems with the first The argument for the debate between the strong one and strong institutions, for instance, so many people, so many people, so much more people, and that's not also the dangerous issue. So, we are like, how long do we You actually have like the one one for like the strong institutions that we need to resolve the dangerous problem challenges. My second question is around is like, I mean, we talk, we've spoken about and eloquently about liquid foods in Africa. And like, what about democratic foods? At times, there are some people that are conducting democratic foods in Africa. I mean, there's very much time in power, like 20 years, 50 years of power. So far, like, I know they are like, that's the tune of Western. I mean, they're listening about how long they spend the power. So, I mean, what's like, wait about that? I mean, I have democratic food in Africa. But like most people talk about democratic rules. At times you see some people like spending three times, I mean three time limit, for instance, in Madagascar. In other one is like protesting in Madagascar, like big of salt claim. And like you see so many other people like that. I mean, we kill this institution in Africa. So that and then at that time, I'm also not democratic scene in Africa, and that can be so when did you focus on the same thing in Africa, not the only Africa. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Then the fellow behind you, so shall we know. A long time. Yes, uh, thank you so much for such complex presentation. It's a great discussion that's going on. My question is uh, mainly in terms of you know responses after school, right? Because practically, you know, whether that's at the international level or regional level within Africa, the response is always like you know, you know, for example, you know, condemning the coup and calling for return of um, the you know the statement of the leader. Or return, return to democracy and whatnot without really understanding the contextual factors that contribute to it. So um, I want to really just hear your take in terms of how do we or how do African leaders respond to such rules uh, and by first understanding the, the contextual dynamics and not have such a, a foreign policy decision that are also probably detrimental as um, we see with uh, a change responsive to the Thank you. And then we have the lady in the back. And then... mm -hmm. Thank you. May I ask that my intervention be recorded? Is this being recorded? Yeah. Or is the recording? Please. In front of. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
comment on really a deep discussion here. Uh, and I, I'm with Pathfinder uh, Press, and I wanted to recommend two books. Uh, one would be uh, The Works of Thomas Sankara, because mm -hmm. you do have a revolution there, uh, short lived, but they did organize grassroots. Yes. They did represent the will of the people. They're spoke there by him on women, very important. And the second one I would recommend is one of uh, women in Cuba, revolution in the revolution, uh, very much on the topic. Thank you very much for those recommendations. All I, I, I confirm the value of the books, <laughs> and uh, especially Sankara's. Thank you. So it's time to end. So we're just going to hand back to Pearl. Did you have a final word for this discussion? It has been a remarkable discussion. So many different layers and players to it. And I particularly welcome our sister from Niger. We did have three panelists who went missing, but I think they were from Bamako, Mali, and Chad. And those we tried to get from Niger declined. So you're scarce. We will really value your panel tomorrow. Thank you very much. And to you too. Yeah. You know, um, I, I came to be a discussant. To give my paper that I gave in another context, and I explained the context that it was prepared for Nigeria to advise our president because we thought he was being rash. Um, Quite right. And you know, uh, so all your points are very well taken. Uh, and if you notice, when I put all the actors, I said, what do the people of Niger want? Mm -hmm. You know, there's democracy question. A, a perspective from them that actually even Biden is not uh, taken seriously because Biden is only concerned about those drones mm -hmm. and what will happen to them. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, um, we need to hear the perspective of Nigerians. Um, how do, you know, African leaders, how do they respond to coups? Um, oh, oh, okay. So there are coups that are not done by uh, military people. The problem with the AU and with ECOWAS is that those coups, they don't take seriously, you know. And it is hypocritical. It's uh, problematic. But they are all politicians. And if we take a leap from the UN and how it's handling things, you know, uh, a lot of considerations that are neither rational in the truth, you know, like to a lay person, or rational in terms of political calculus, you know, take get, if they, if they start uh, paying attention to that, who will be left? There will be two people attending AU, <laughs> you know, so I think. They yeah. can't afford to push that envelope because there's a real problem. Um, there's also, um, yeah, democracy is flawed and inextricably linked. I agree with the uh, capitalism. Can we reimagine how to come up with new models? Yes. Yes. And I want you to lead the charge I will follow. <laughs> <laughs> But it is, this is one of my constant preoccupations. Because for me, you know, all this theorizing about democracy, even accountability, what does it mean on the ground? And is it being taken seriously? You'll find it isn't. Because if we do take accountability seriously, even in the US, any of these people in office, they wouldn't be there. There are people who do all kinds of deals. And there's pay to play in the US, you know. There's all kinds of, you know. Um, so I think at some point, I think people are just, um, they want stability. And if, if, if we're going for stability, um, the messiness of what democracy should really be that would produce the will of the people, we won't get there. Yeah. Uh, but we'll, everybody will be able to some kind of normal life. Um, okay.
I think there are many alternative ways of thinking about democracy that are alive and well, but they're not very alive and healthy in the United States. So this is not the model. But if you look more broadly, even within Western democracy, there are already in Germany, Scandinavia, there are many, many more things. And I'm absolutely, final note, convinced that Africans have the capacity to come up with more participatory methods of organizing. Well, let's talk more. To be continued. <laughs> thank you very much for wonderful discussion. Thank you. And thank you, Professor Robinson, <laughs> Professor Okay, for saving the day. Thank you. 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 Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>